<laughs> Hello, good morning. Um, welcome back. It's good to see all of you. I hope and trust you had a good Thanksgiving. Um, do you eat some good food? Who took, who took like more than one nap? Yes, right? Me too. Good. I hope it was, it's really good to have some time to rest and to reflect on God's kindness to us. Um, and, and here we are. We, I was just realizing there are no full weeks left of school. You guys are that close to being done. Um, and things are, if they haven't already, they are about to get pretty crazy and busy. Phone, fun things, festive things, the holiday cheer, but you're also about ready to gear up for finals and final projects and papers and homework and reading. Um, it gets really full really fast. Um, I love the Christmas season. I love all the festivities and stuff. Um, I really do. It It probably is my favorite time of the year. But I will be honest, there's also a part of me that feels like I sort of have to take a deep breath and like buckle my seatbelts and hang on until like February. Um, And I wonder if maybe you might feel some of that as well. I was just starting to think about all the things coming up, right? There are holiday parties and gatherings. There are gifts to buy, traditions to create or maintain, um, cards to send, travel to arrange, food to prepare, cookies to decorate, games and concerts to attend. Also for you, there are finals to study for, projects to finish, homework to do, probably family dynamics to navigate, houses and dorm rooms to clean, and then Carter Christmas, right? That's happening. So that list alone increases my heart rate. (laughs) I don't know how you feel as you were hearing all that. My heart rate starts to increase when I think about all the things coming up. Um, And it it can be very easy to get sort of swept up in all of that, the good and the hard, and then to come out on the other side totally exhausted physically, totally spent emotionally, and totally dry spiritually. So this morning, as I was considering what to talk about, I thought I would just get really practical together um, and that we could lean into some practices together to help us navigate the Advent season more intentionally. Um, One of my favorite Christmas songs is Joy to the World, and it puts it this way. It says, Joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king, let every heart prepare him room. Proverbs 4.23 talks about this idea that we need to watch over our hearts with all diligence because from our hearts flows the wellsprings of life. In other words, the way that we lean into the world and how we think and what we prioritize, the choices we make and the things we do, all of that comes from the deep inner parts of our hearts. And often the busyness that's headed our way in this season means that it's hard to even know what's going on in here sometimes. So none of this is new. You've heard all these things before, but here are a few ways, a few reminders um, of ways that we can watch over our hearts and prepare him room during this Advent season. First, seek out silence. Now often when we think of silence, we think convents or monasteries, or we think of the absence of audible noise. But expand your definition of silence for a minute and just think of all of the other types of noise reverberating in your minds and your hearts right now. Take a second to consider all of the voices in your head about what you need to do, what you need to accomplish, where you need to be, who you need to talk to, what you need to buy, that's noise. Think about that running list of shoulds, both the good shoulds, right, and the burdensome ones. That's noise. Now consider all of the visual noise that flashes before you every moment of the day. The scrolling and the shopping, um, the news headlines, the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey gossip, right, Um, the latest viral video, right, all of that is noise. Now, think about the actual noise. 
Christmas music, late night dance parties on your hall, the playlist that you have going as you study. Now, none of those things are bad. In fact, they are often really delightful. But perhaps part of the Advent season is an invitation to remove those things for a bit and to be quiet, to sit in silence. Here's, what's hap here's what happens when we do that. When we sit in silence, it gives our brains and our emotions a chance to catch up with our bodies. We finally sit still long enough to pay attention to what God is actually doing in our lives and what our heart's saying and what's worrying us and what's exciting us and what's making us happy and what's making us sad. And that's why silence can actually be really unnerving. Um, it forces us to pay attention to the stuff that we just like to blow past with distraction. Silence makes space. It prepares our hearts to encounter Jesus. So here's what this could look like, practically. Find five minutes, just five. Start with five, all right? It'll feel longer than five. Start with five and just be quiet. Sit in complete silence. No music, no Instagram, no podcasts, just quiet. And here's the thing, you don't actually have to build anything new into your already busy routines and schedules. Just consider margins you already have. So maybe it's five minutes walking between classes. Maybe it's driving in the car, that's my personal habit. Maybe it's in the library before you dive into homework. But when things are busy and hectic and demands are high and only increasing, we need those opportunities to settle our minds and our hearts. And silence, it really helps with that. Similarly, find solitude. Silence and solitude go together, and I also realize that both of those things are really hard to find on a residential college. <laughs> Again, you don't need to add anything new to your already busy routine. But take a look at the transition times in your day, or those random 30 minutes between things, and instead of filling them with something or someone, how could you find space to be alone for a bit? The goal with solitude, this is important, is to be alone with God. That is how solitude is different from loneliness, because the truth is you are not alone. God is with you. He indwells you. He is constantly present with you. And so solitude, it awakens our busy and distracted hearts to that reality. Being alone with God refreshes our perspective and it gives us space to breathe. So this Advent season, this crazy season, try to find some time to be alone with God. You might be surprised at what you hear from him and you might be surprised about what you learn of yourself. Okay, next, embrace moments to practice patience, right? <laughs> Somebody's like, yes. Advent is a season in the church calendar that invites us into the practice of waiting. It's literally what Advent is. It's waiting. And waiting is very difficult in our instant Amazon Prime culture. So when we are forced to wait, all right, think about this. When the internet is slow, when you're stuck in traffic, when you're standing in line for coffee or for food in the Great Hall, what do we do? We often immediately go to distraction. Now, again, that's not always bad. Sometimes using our time to, in line to catch up with email or to respond to a text is good. That can be a good thing. But usually what we do is we grab our phones when we're standing in line just because it's a habit. A habit of distracting ourselves while waiting it actually robs us of the opportunity to cultivate patience, perseverance, and maybe even a little self-control. So, as your responsibilities increase and stress is on the rise, notice and then embrace those opportunities and those moments in your day when you are forced to wait. Lean into the practice of patience without distraction. Invite Jesus into the uncomfortable and even frustrating challenge of waiting. 
doing so pushes us to face the fact that ultimately we are not in control, but we belong to the one who is, and who loves you. In fact, what we celebrate at Christmas, the word becoming flesh, is the most tangible and concrete demonstration of God's love for us, isn't it? We know this. He loved us so much that he gave. He gave his son so that whoever believes in him can live life with God forever. Our God is at the core a God who gives. He is generous and he gives abundantly. We lack nothing. We have everything we need. So another way to prepare our hearts for Christmas, to prepare room in our hearts for Jesus, is to be generous. The biblical idea of generosity is more about the heart posture than the actual gift. In other words, to be generous is to be eager to serve um, and kind of like standing there ready to give with a joyful heart. It's to be open-handed and to be keen to offer liberally whatever is needed. Christmas is the season of gift-giving, but how can you practice generosity in other ways? Perhaps you could cultivate a posture of encouragement rather than criticism. You could give generously with kind words. Maybe you could be generous in your attention to others. You can learn how to listen wholly and intently while someone is talking to you. A generous heart could look like extending grace and giving someone the benefit of the doubt instead of assuming the worst about that person. There are lots of ways to be generous with your time and your abilities and your insight. And of course, being generous with your money and resources, that's really important too. We practice generosity when we do that. It lifts our gaze off of ourselves just for a little bit, and it forces us to think of others. But it's also an important habit which starts to loosen our grip on our idols. You realize how much you love something when you have to give it away. In the same vein, be grateful. Every year, it's shocking to me how quickly we move from a a day set aside for gratitude, for being thankful, how quickly we move from that day to a day all about getting stuff, right? I think Black Friday sales started on Wednesday this year. Um, It's crazy. And it's such a symptom of our human heart, isn't it? Um, We are prone to wanting bigger, better, shinier, and newer. And then we spend a lot of our time comparing what we have to what others have. Exercising gratitude, it challenges that entire downward spiral, um, and it helps to put things in perspective for us. Just like God's generosity frees us to give, God's ownership of all things allows us to be content. We don't own anything, nothing. It has all been given to us by God and from God, who is the giver of all good things. So being thankful for what we have, whether it's a little or a lot, it points our hearts to the giver himself. And gratitude, it goes beyond material things. I mean, when was the last time that you were grateful for your intellect or for your abilities or for your health or just for another day to live? And here's the crazy thing about gratitude, is that even when we take stock of our life and it feels like we've been given some hard circumstances or hard family dynamic or hard situations, even when it's hard, gratitude postures our hearts towards dependence on, trust in, and surrender to God himself. And we begin to see that even at the bottom of what feels like a pit— Jesus is there. Thanksgiving Day might be over until next year, right? But watch over your heart this Advent season. I'm going to try to do this with my heart too, by practicing gratitude. Finally, encounter God through his word, right? You are all tired. You've made it through an entire semester, like almost a couple weeks left. You've learned a ton. You've worked really hard. Um, And at this point in the semester and this point in the year, 
often the first thing to go when things get even busier is time in God's word, right? I get it. I'm actually there too. I have to be very careful about this. But this, you guys, it's life. This is where life is found. Here's how the psalmist describes it in Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Um, I was paying attention, I was looking at those verbs. Did you hear those verbs? The word of God revives, it makes wise, it rejoices the heart, it enlightens the eyes. And it's not because there's something magical about the words on the page, but because every word brings us into life with God himself. They tell the story of what is real and who is in charge of history and how much he loves us. And then that story, what it does, it invites us in to participate in kingdom work, to taste and see the goodness of God and to press into his faithfulness. If we want to survive busy seasons and if we want to come out on the other side as like somewhat whole people, (laughs) we have to feast on God's word regularly. Here's the thing, okay, get creative about this. The minute I start talking about reading the Bible, I know, I know that half of you immediately feel guilty and the other half of you feel like, whatever, okay, or maybe there's somewhere in between. I am not saying that you need to have a 30-minute quiet time every morning at 5 a.m. You can if you want, right? What I am saying is immerse yourself in the words of God as found in Scripture. I like the language of immersion because it opens up possibilities for us. Reading, reading it, is one way to be immersed. But so is listening to it read to you or drawing it out or memorizing it, or singing it, or walking with it in your memory as you're meditating on it. Again, start small and start with the margins you already have. Try listening to a psalm on your way to breakfast. Consider writing out a passage and taping it to your mirror. Um, Sketch out what you hear as you listen to a Bible app or as you're in church and you're hearing the word read to you. Engage your whole self as you expose your heart and your mind and your body to God's word. After all, Advent is a celebration of the word made flesh. So really, like what better way is there for us to prepare our hearts for the word than with God's words? It is going to get crazy in the next couple of weeks crazy with fun and crazy with memories and crazy with all the holiday cheer. It's also going to get crazy with school and with stress and with difficult situations at home. But Jesus was born into our crazy one night in Bethlehem. It was a frantic birth. There were so many last minute adjustments. I bet there was a lot of crying and a lot of worry. He is not hiding in a place far away from the hurry and the chaos of the season. He is right smack dab in the middle of it. That is why Jesus came. So let's just maybe work to keep watch over our hearts and to prepare him room this Advent season. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for these students. I'm so grateful for your faithfulness to them. I'm so grateful for the way that you have brought us this far. Lord God, we are tired. We have a lot going on and a lot more coming our way. So Lord, I ask that through your spirit, you would give us hearts that can be still and calm and hearts that will prepare room for Jesus. We are so thankful for Jesus, that he came, that he died, that he raised again, and that he's promised to come back and get us. We pray all these things in his name. Amen.